so the title is They Did It Again, The Fed's Role in the Great Monetary Contraction of 2008. And I, you might actually say that my talk is just an extension of some of the remarks that Tim made this morning about, uh, about uh, the Fed's performance in the early part of the crisis. Uh, the title that comes from uh, uh, what Ben Bernanke said on the occasion of uh, Milton Friedman's uh, 90th birthday celebration, which occurred before the crisis, where he ended by saying, regarding the Great Depression, you're right, we did it, we're very sorry, but thanks to you, we won't do it again. I uh, am, of course, uh, about to try to convince you that, in fact, they did do it again. It uh, is uh, uh, to have failed to take appropriate, timely monetary expansion <coughs> episodes to prevent a severe reduction and collapse in nominal activity, nominal spending in particular. But uh, in order to, sh to compare what happened under Bernanke's Fed and what happened in the 1930s episode that is the focus of Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's analysis, I want to go back and talk a little bit about that, latter, ep that earlier episode. Uh, what Friedman writes at one point in the monetary history of the United States regarding the Great Contraction is, as you see here, that it is clear that monetary policies followed from 1929 to 1933 were not the inevitable result of external pressures. At all times, the system was technically in a position to adopt alternative policies. What alternative policies does he accuse the Fed of having failed to adopt, specifically purchases of government securities on a larger scale than what actually took place, which would have reduced the likelihood of the banking crisis. So that's, that's the, the uh, 1930s episode. Here you see the, uh, the outcome of this failure, according to uh, uh, Friedman and Schwartz, in the uh, substantial decline in both prices and real outputs uh, over the course of the period in question, with a, a, a gradual recovery uh, afterwards. Well, uh, now, a uh, part of the story about the Fed's failure in the 30s is also that it engaged in sterilization. And this chart explains uh, gold is actually accumulating at the Fed during the period of the Great Depression, or the Great Contraction, the earlier part. That's that top line. You can see what's happening in gold. But at the bottom are the bills and securities had held by the Fed. And although there are seasonal movements in those, uh, the trend there is distinctly downwards. The net result is that the balance sheet of the Fed as a whole, the monetary base, therefore, is not expanding. So the, the Fed is offsetting what would have been a gold-based expansion by actually uh, shrinking its balance sheet. And that's what I mean by a sterilization policy. So you have a kind of sterilization going on. If you look at the subsequent developments, the story is also not very good with regard to the Fed's performance, because here you can see how Federal Reserve credit, which is again the active component of the Fed's balance sheet, is flat. What's driving recovery to the extent that it takes place is an increase in the nominal gold stock, consisting first of all of a one-time increase due to the devaluation of gold, followed by an increase in the real quantity of gold, which mostly comes from abroad, particularly after Hitler's rise to power. And even here, the Fed engages in sterilization. You see this flat spot in the monetary base in gold stock. That's because uh, starting in uh, 37, late 36, the Fed uh, sterilizes some of the gold inflows. And so the monetary base does not grow as the red line as much as the gold stock would have made it grow if the Fed had not taken countervailing steps. And uh, this is said by many economic historians to have been a major reason for the secondary or, or Roosevelt depression of 37-38. Okay, so that's all a recap of the past. There's a sterilization again. Let's talk about the recent crisis and see what parallels we can find. Well, first of all, the basic facts, major collapse of uh, spending that starts actually in the spring of 2008, spending uh, followed by uh, 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 a collapse in the price level. Uh, uh, this is, sorry, this is real, G, real GDP in the price level. So, well, we know that happened. Here's nominal spending. And again, I want to draw your attention to how nominal spending is, is declining in the beginning of 2008, and it continues to decline uh, throughout the rest of the, the year. So this is not, this, that's not 
this collapse in spending, M times V, if you like, is not a consequence of the layman's disaster. It's been going on long before that. During that whole period until the layman's collapse, roughly thereabouts, the balance sheet of the Fed is flat. There's no general expansion of uh, the Fed's balance sheet in the monetary base. That's despite all kinds of emergency lending going on during the period shown on this chart. Uh, and it's because the Fed is sterilizing all of its emergency loans. That is, it's getting rid of Treasury securities that have dominated its balance sheet to make up for the uh, increase in its other assets related mainly to emergency lending. Uh, and, uh, that's another way of saying that it's engaging in negative open market operations to compensate its emergency lending program. Remember, from this time onwards, spending is collapsing in the economy. Money times velocity, declining. Now, why did the Fed insist on sterilizing? It's because it was determined, with its obsession that everybody has been correctly harping on, um, targeting interest rates. Is determined to maintain its federal federal funds target rate, which is shown by the uh, black line here, right? Uh, the discount rate is the red line, and they they're separated by 25 basis points, so they move together. And it, it's insisting on maintaining it at two percent, and it does that relatively successfully until the fall. But mind you, here the point is, yes, it's succeeding in maintaining its target up till. Uh, no September, but the target is not consistent with the stable level of spending in the economy. There's a collapse of spending, which, after the fact at least, is perfectly clear that that target was too high, too high to be consistent with the stable flow of money times uh, velocity, stable level. Now, as you can see, in this period post layman's this is the effective federal funds rate. They're losing control of the rate, but they don't want to lose control. By hook or by crook, they're trying to keep the funds rate above what arguably is its true natural level, which is collapsing in the wake of the Lehman's failure. Now, after Lehman's, let me go back a bit. After Lehman's failure, quantitative easing, QE1, begins. But let's get something straight here. This is entirely unintentional. The Fed is buying now massive amounts of, uh, it's making massive last resort loans to AIG in particular. It no longer is comfortable reducing its treasuries below this level. Consequently, it has lost the power to sterilize. QE1 was simply what happened when the Fed couldn't sterilize any longer. That wasn't QE1. As lender of last resort lending. Well, the, Q, the quantitative easing retroactively refers to this whole period when it begins with the expansion of the balance sheet. No, it doesn't. Oh. From November. QE1 re refers November. to the November 25th, uh, November 25th announcement. Well, the, the, that's the first if event. You, if you regard that as quantitative easing, but not the actual growth in the balance sheet, right. but in fact, the, the Fed had only allowed its balance sheet to grow in the first place because of uh, its inability to sterilize. Ordinarily, without, the, without QE1, that, that growth in the balance sheet would have come right back down in the next few months. So it, it well, they decided not to try to undo it, in other words. Can we, right? Can we be skinny? Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll talk about this for, for later. The That's point fine. is that the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet begins as a result of the fact that it's unable and unwilling to sterilize the expansion of its uh, last resort loans, and afterwards it becomes a deliberate, <coughs> conscientious policy. However, even then, but before then, the Fed had instituted interest payments on reserves. And this is because it couldn't sterilize, and since they were still determined in October 2008 to try to maintain their federal funds target, which was too high, they resorted, uh, 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 they resorted to interest on reserves as a way to prevent the balance sheet expansion from spilling over into the federal funds market and into other loan markets uh, uh, afterwards. This is admitted by Bernanke and by many other sources. So it was a deliberate Fed policy, you can read the quote yourself, to make sure that once its balance sheet is growing, although it 
uh, uh, like I said, it initially it's allowed it, it, it allows it to grow only because it can't sterilize. It tries to offset the effect of that sterilization with interest payments on reserves, the express purpose of which is to keep banks from turning around and lending the extra base money in the federal funds market where it will uh, tend to depress the federal funds rate below the Fed's, uh, the target that the Fed is still attempting to achieve. It was only after the fact that the Fed decided to treat interest on reserves as being the control variable for monetary policy. So what's happening here is you introduce interest rates on reserves, like that little dashed line right there eventually settles at 25 basis points where it remains until December 2015, right? Uh, when they first instituted, it, it's a way of trying to maintain this unchanged target of, uh, well, that's finally been dropped down to, uh, by then, to 1%. But eventually they start saying, well, no, we now have a policy where between the interest rate on reserves and the lower bound, which once the uh, overnight repos get going, itself becomes a positive number, our target is now that range. It's very easy to hit, hit a target if you move the target to where you already are, or someplace, that, someplace uh, uh, make it a range that covers where you already are. Now here you can see the relationship between interest on reserves and interbank loans. Interbank loans, right, do decline. They spike just before Lincoln's. There's a number of reasons for that. And then they decline. Oh, but they start picking up again. These two lines show the introduction in two stages because there are two different sets of banks involved of the interest payments on reserves. And so once that process is complete, that you really see the interbank market tank. Banks aren't lending to each other because it's not tempting to lend at a federal funds rate that's lower than interest rate that is being paid on bank reserves. It's as simple as that. So it's not that the federal funds market dried up uh, earlier. I think that somebody mentioned uh, the federal interbank lending drying up in 2007 in England, perhaps, but in the United States it doesn't happen until uh, October 2008. Now this is a little bit crowded, this chart, but I'll make it simpler later on. Now, here you see the three-month Treasury bill rate, right? Here, the red line, again, interest rate on reserves. Notice that at first, at first it's higher than uh, 25 basis points, and then they mess around with it lower. Um, and the, this is interbank lending. Now, to see really what's happening in interbank lending and, and how it behaves, what you want to look at is, uh, at is the opportunity cost of holding reserves, which Roughly speaking, we can treat as the difference between the rate being paid on reserve balances, excess and required in this case, and the treasury bill rate, which we'll treat as an opportunity cost. Now here's a chart where I take those values and I combine them into this green line, which is the difference between the treasury rate and the interest rate on reserves, which is the opportunity cost of reserves. And you see, as the opportunity cost of reserve holding declines, you have a corresponding, very closely associated decline in interbank lending, which is what you'd expect. So there is a, a, an explanation for why banks stop lending to each other, which is consistent with what Bernanke said they wanted the interest rate on reserves to do. It's not just me saying, look, these, these figures seem to imply that the Fed's policy is putting a, 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 is a causing an arrest of interbank lending. Right, now here's your QE3 episodes, right? This is true enough, the December announcement of QE1. But, you know, it, it amounts to, so you can see the balance sheet actually doesn't go up anymore. They've just decided that this expansion is going to qualify retroactively, they're going to call it a QE1. They do purchase more uh, of, of certain kinds of treasuries. And then, uh, then you have the subsequent rounds of QE2 and QE3. The question then is, why aren't these more effective, and why in particular QE1 and QE3 not as effective as they might be? Of course, the big news here is how um, a very large, practically 100% of this expansion translated into growth in excess reserves. Now, I want to make something very clear, because 
some economists get this wrong, the number of excess reserves held in the banking system is not simply a function of how many reserves the Fed creates or the central bank creates. That's, it's true that banks must hold all the reserves that are created, but whether those reserves are held as excess reserves depends on the lending activity of the banks, which if it sufficiently multiplies deposits will cause the excess reserves to go down regardless of how much the nominal stock of total reserve increases. That's why, for example, in Weimar, Germany, in the hyperinflation of, of the early 20s, you had much more growth in the monetary base and in total bank reserves than you've had under QE by a considerable uh, magnitude change. But banks did not accumulate excess reserves. They lent so much that they, they actually their reserve ratios and their excess reserves, if, if we can speak of such a thing in that context, uh, uh, declined. The real reserves of the banking system declined because the opportunity cost of holding reserves in that hyperinflation were actually very high. Here you have the opposite situation, the opportunity cost of holding reserves very low. And it's true that we're talking most of this period, right, we're talking about a 25 basis point return on reserves. That's not much of an incentive you would think. But it is a plenty of incentive when other market rates are relatively low compared to that rate. And you have to consider that with low margins, Low market rates generally, them set, that, set, that itself a consequence of the collapse of the economy and the collapse of spending all around, uh, the incentive to just pile on reserves, and regulations eventually contribute to this as well, is very strong. So, uh, and this is why uh, John Greenwood is quite right. At least in the United States, when the base grew, bank deposits grew proportionately. But they didn't grow more than proportionately as they would have done if banks had had an incentive to set, shed excess reserves instead of accumulating them. Uh, but it wasn't quite as bad as the Japanese case, where you don't, don't even have a one-to-one -one increase in deposits related to bank uh, reserves. All right. Uh, here I show uh, that problem. The reserve balances of the f at, at the Fed uh, divided by banks' checkable deposits. So you can think of that as the, the uh, uh, reserve ratio, if you like. You can see how that jumps up, the blue line. And uh, the left scale is the reserve balances considered just abs in absolute terms. And finally, the red line is what's happening to total checkable deposits, or narrow money in this case. And as you can see, it's, it's quite flat. And by the way, the analogy here with the 1930s is where the policy also said to have contributed to the 1937-38 contraction within the Great Depression uh, of increasing banks' reserve requirements. It's controversial among economists just how contractionary that was, but it was, it's generally regarded as contractionary. In that case, you're raising the minimum reserve ratios imposed on banks. In this case, you're simply making it more inviting for them to sit on reserves and voluntarily, as it were, hold high reserve ratios. You're not forcing them legally to maintain these <coughs> legal minimums. Um, right, and here you can also see the two lines. This is layman's. These two lines are interest on reserves. And the real jump in the uh, reserve ratio is following the uh, introduction of interest in reserves. <coughs> One more. A uh, chart uh, showing here I have a single line because of the scale, but that's roughly where interest on reserves <coughs> is introduced. Lehman's failure is a little bit before that. And here you can see that there's also some consequence, apparent consequence, because this is just correlation, of course, uh, with uh, the commercial and industrial lending cease to increase and then start to decline. Treasury and agency securities are pretty flat. And here again, you have the reserve balances and the interbank loans. Now, Walter Badgett, of course, in Lombard Street, famously argued that the task of a central bank is to provide liquidity to the general marketplace, right? To keep markets liquid, to lend freely at high rates. Badgett was not talking about bailing out failing institutions and targeting specific institutions. He was talking about widespread lending. It had to be lending in those days because there was no equivalent to open market operations at the time in England. But it was meant to be widespread lending to keep solvent firms liquid. 
What the Fed did during this first crucial phase of the Great Recession was to target support to specific institutions and take liquidity away from the solvent general market, which is turning the classical last resort lending rule precisely on its head. And in that sense, it could not have done a worse job dealing with that stage of the crisis. So I personally think that uh, that when uh, I personally hope that when the the uh, seminal history of this episode is written, and I hope it will be someday, and I hope it won't be 30 years or 40 years from now, that that history will tell a much different story about Bernanke's Fed and how it conducted itself during the crucial <coughs> early phases of the Great Recession. And it will be a story that is a lot more like the story about what the Fed did during the Great Contraction than the stories we typically <coughs> hear. And I'll end there.